applause, we're going to start with Brielle. She's going to do a great job. <laughs> so the two minutes of your life, it's a great team. <laughs> so her name is Brielle. Okay, so I'm Brielle. Uh, so I'm from Las Vegas. I'm going to talk about that and tell you some things that you probably don't think of when you think of Las Vegas. Um, so I live about 10 minutes from the Strip, which is the famous big street with all the different hotels. And pretty much everyone lives about 10 to 15 minutes in a circle. It's like a big valley. You can see like from side to side. So it's really big, but in a way it's actually really small. Now that I'm in Texas, I'm like, wow, it's really small. Um, so um, there's a lot of things to do. And uh, everyone knows about the Strip. And of course, you have to be 21. So you know, I haven't really been, I've been there, but not to all the things you're thinking of. Um, there's concerts always, and people come and do like residencies. So like Britney Spears is going to be here for two months, like December and January. So it's kind of cool because you get like all these days you can go see. Um, but there's also a lake 30 minutes away. So I grew up boating pretty much every weekend. And um, in the other 30 minutes, there's mountains and you go snowboarding. So everyone says it's like the same place. You can wakeboard in one day and snowboard in the same. So I always like that. There's also Red Rock, which is like a mini national park. And that's all just like in a 30 minute radius. So people probably don't think of that when they think of Las Vegas. Um, also, I've really found to love the location. Um, it's four hours from the beach. It's four hours, two to four hours from every big like national park, um, Grand Canyon, Zion's two hours away. And then it's four hours from all the big snowboarding mountains like Lake Tahoe and Mammoth. So I always said I wasn't gonna go back to Vegas, but um, now that I'm left and I'm like, Texas needs to drive like 10 hours to get somewhere. So I don't know, I might go back. I really love where I'm from. Talks all the time in Austin, so um, 
But anyway, so this one was specifically about Pogol. And so I'm going to break you up into your groups. And you guys are going to talk about the six questions that I gave you. Um, maybe it's got a little harder. So just so you know, Pogol, we can pause the video. It's process-oriented, data inquiry learning. It's a big part of what we do in our process. So go ahead and break up in your groups, talk about it, and we'll come back together and we can kind of wrap up. I started. It's like the Oh, so, okay, yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. So, just like, <laughs> the students kind of cram again. Yeah. For the okay. We also said in particular with science education. Y'all remember what we said about that? It's just like, has the impression that it's really important yeah. because like it's all in relation and then just kind of like facts came to us. Okay, so yeah, he called it crisis of passion and creativity. So, uh, what do y'all think about that? Do you agree? I mean, personally, I didn't, I didn't like that. I actually like memorizing stuff. Yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's more like <laughs> Okay, well, what do you think about passion and creativity? I mean, that's where I found the disagreement. I, I mean, on, on the, whole, the whole and the large masses, there may be a lack of passion and creativity in education, period, not even just science. I feel like there's still a like, good number of kids that want to go out there and are passionate by science. I mean, they're doing research. At this university. I think with lectures though, like when they're just talking and talking, it's harder for me to ask questions because I'm just like, okay, I need to write this down, write this down. Oh, I have a question, I'll ask them after, but then I have to go to my next class, you know? But in the ones where we're doing like activities, you ask your neighbors, and if, it, if it's a good question, then the neighbors go to the TA. If it's a better question, the TAs go to the professor, you know what I mean? So I think that. And I feel like that's just a good environment because often I found myself freshman year like intimidated to ask questions in such a big lecture, especially if you look around and there's no conversation and everyone seems to be getting it but you and you really don't want to ask questions. That's also a friendlier place, you know, it's not a place to ask your friends, ask your neighbors. So you said you like classes that are structured that way. How many classes do you actually have that are structured that way? <coughs> yeah. Um, my open class, we break up into activities here and there. Um, and then this, oh, I'm not going to go. Well, yeah, we're yeah. teaching this class. Um, and then, um, oh, my stats class, bio stats, they do it that way. And um, that actually really helps because the TA is kind of like explaining. And then I think that's the only classes. But I'm only taking like two other classes, like five classes. What about everybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Physics. I'm in, I'm in the yeah, yeah, physics. They have the same program. Like yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. They have LAs. Like, for the side of like you know the traditional lecture, I feel like we also have so many resources to ask questions. Yeah. For, you know, like what prevents you from like asking your neighbor like in a lecture hall any questions? So how is it? And still ask the person like the left or the right if you don't understand something. But then you might miss what they said. Sometimes I'm like, oh wait, so just tell me after. I gotta write these down. <laughs> well, I just say that because I'm not sure if it's just a transition from being underclassmen to an upperclassman, but I have no classes that are like that. Anymore. All my all my classes are purely lecture based, so and TA session to work out problems. <laughs> See, I took um, lower division calculus, like the first two, and it was like completely flipped, where we like the teacher didn't teach anything in the classroom, and it was awful. Like it was so hard to learn. Like doing like, like the I guess this is like the hybrid flipped, where like we have like some instruction in the classroom, which I think makes a huge difference because now I'm in like a regular calculus, and it's completely lecture based, and it's like ten times easier than like having like no instruction at all in the classroom.
Okay, so yeah, it may depend on the subject too. Like when you said they were just like sort of introducing it to calculus class and stuff, like that may be really difficult with math. Yeah. Sometimes you just need the guy going through problems up the top. Yeah. So what do you do? You like break up into groups and work on problems that he gives you, and then like a lot. I don't know if he just like taught it. Or he didn't like do it very well, but like a lot of times we didn't even get to go over the problems in like class. So like it was like you're struggling with your group mates and then like if none of you have any idea what's going on or like run a lot of resources to like get help. And they were homework problems from the night before. So it's not even like new problems. It was like we already did this. These are the problems that like just people have stuff on. So it was really it was even new material. Yeah. Okay. So uh, our next question that we have to answer is what about when you're helping a student? student gets that like aha moment. How does that how does that feel for you guys? Have you guys experienced <laughs> I feel like the aha moment too. <laughs> 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 I know how to teach them. Yeah, yeah. Do you have like specific examples when you help the students get to like that aha moment? It's just great. Yeah. There's this one time I was teaching this one kid that how um photons excite electrons and how that's related to wavelength and uh, frequency and how those are inversely related. And the kid, the kid was having like a lot of trouble with it. And his peers were kind of understanding it, but he was like not kind of seeing the big picture. And um, it took him like a couple minutes, but like eventually, like almost towards the end of my explanation, he was like, "Oh!" And it just like really clicks for him. So. Um. So what about where Pogo's going in the future? I know the first thing is that they want to put it in a lot more classrooms. Um, they're, I know they're developing more for math, like right now and a bunch of math. So. I like it. I good. Actually, I don't even know how old this video is because we watched it way back when I first started. Oh, really? And so it, it may be that they already have like, the whole Pogo thing. Oh, I didn't realize it was older. Yeah. Um, can you do that? Yeah, it's mostly basic. Yeah, like, so basically they just, they want us to start implementing into schools this whole discovery process. And that's, that's like the ultimate goal of Pogol is to try and have like a viable alternative, I guess, to just sitting and lecturing. And we're sure it's going to take a lot of work because the lecture system is just what's always been there. And so to try and come up with something new and novel and actually implement it everywhere, that's... I thought it was interesting when he was talking about like people who are like art made or like artists and stuff, how they're like, oh, we don't really want to take a science class. So like if they do, they just like, like, like we're talking about the academic bullying thing. Um, I think it would create like a better like, generation of like, people, even if just knowing those basic fundamental like discovery skills, even if you know Okim has nothing to do with painting a picture, like he still can figure out life lessons and stuff like that in the same concepts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the great scientists are the ones who come up with some like new and novel idea that no one ever thought of before. Like, they just <laughs> seem to pull it out of left field, and well, so maybe we'll start helping to develop that whole creative thinking, going at problems from a different direction type thing, and maybe that'll help a new generation. <laughs> When I got home, I was excited So, what did you think about the effectiveness of Pogol? Do you think it's actually going to be something that catches hold in the future? I mean, we, we sort of implement that now, just with like the classroom. And like, yeah, I think it like works pretty well. I know like a lot of students have trouble with it sometimes, just because they're not used to having to really pay attention and work in class. But I feel like it really helps in the long run in terms of grades. And, uh, yeah, right. I mean, even if you don't get such a good grade in this class, I think you learn important skills just having to do this. Because you actually have to sit and work and prepare for class. And then you have to try and apply that knowledge to a problem you haven't seen before. It's something that's kind of familiar, but at the same time you have to adjust to something different that you haven't seen before. Maybe like just tweak your method a little bit. That's, that's something that's really weird and hard to get. Like if you're just not used to it at all. But I think it's a good 
problem solving. Yeah. Yeah, my accounting class has kind of started to do it. It's kind of weird. It's not a science. Yeah, I mean, he, it is a lot lecture based, but he started uh, letting us break out and like do some problems, and they walk around the room just like how we do. So. Actually, I'm, I'm actually going to be helping my mom because she te teaches here at UT, but she teaches an upper division nutrition class. And that's not one that's really facilitated with discussion. It's mostly just lecture. But she's heard me talking about this so much that she's like, well, maybe I'll try it. And so she wants me to help her come up with um, like discussion questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, she wants me to help her come up with discussion questions that she can give out to her students that they can work on in small groups to try to help them solve. So I think it's spreading pretty far, especially since the like nutrition you would not think would use this sort of method. It's usually you would think it's like the ones where you have to like problem solve. I think MIS is doing that too. It's like the business foundation programs are like taking up this method too, which is kind of interesting. I like it. I know a lot of bio professors are doing that, so like, which is like kind of surprising because like I went through bio without doing the whole program. But I know like the bio class I'm taking next semester and physiology is doing that, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Oh, I guess it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Are you taking systems physiology with um, Paul? Um, I feel like math could benefit a lot what? by using the seven oh, method, yeah, but at the same it. time. So at the same time, it'd be harder to handle. Oh, yeah, but, well, I don't know yet, because it's like I mean, this. Just because, like, that's all it is. Like, math is just practice. Yeah. So, I mean, you almost have to use the book of math when you're doing it already. But just, they don't call it. Uh, and those stories uh, will be canceled. Each other. So it's a non final model. In fact, this is one of the solvents that we use as a non final so solvent, similar to benzene. Oh, because it captures kind of the vision of our class. And so I wanted to know if you guys agree with me. Do you feel like we do some of this process oriented guided inquiry learning in class with our students? Yes. Okay. Um, is that all we do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just just by the, the nature of what it's, it's described as, it's, you know, you have a facilitated uh, kind of learning environment. So you, you have a professor who gives you the uh, bullet points, and then they kind of leave you to discuss amongst yourself and, and you know, kind of gain your own understanding of the material. That's true. Yeah. So sometimes we talk them with some lecture, or we let them struggle with it first, and then we you know, kind of fill it back in with some extra lecture. So it's a, a mixture of trying to get an idea of what's going on on your own as well as some added information from the professors and from us. So if this is kind of the way that science is going, um, do you feel like this is an effective learning method for most students? Why do you think that? It's just, it helps when you have to try and figure something out on your own. Like, I know I remember things more when I actually work through it and try and figure it out on my own rather than having someone tell it to me because I run into that problem all the time with like especially with my geology labs is my TAs will show us this method of how to do something I'm like yeah that makes sense that's great I got it and then I try and go home later and do it and I'm just like wait no I can't remember yeah it's not working good okay and most students I feel like at first want just lecture they just want to sit there and have you tell them the information um, but I think Ash this kind of maybe we've experienced a little bit of what it feels like to go home and realize you don't know anything because you didn't actually get a concept of what we were learning today in class and I feel like this is a really good start in innovating um, the classroom experience so I want to ask one more question how are we as learning assistants a big part of this method somebody who has answered we act as a facilitator okay good we act as facilitators and what does that help why does that help the students um, so basically the students, um, they're interacting with each other to work on the problem or worksheets. And if they come, like, face a brick wall, then we help them. Yes, that's great. And how do you feel, like, for your own benefit, 
being a facilitator? What does that do for you and your understanding of the science? Do you get a dopamine expert when you see people do aha moments in class? Right? It's like mutually beneficial. Oh, I have them. I get it. Yes. And when you have a question later on in your bio 380 600 class about, you know, I don't know, sodium ions or something like that, do you ever feel like the things that we talked about in class today stick with you as well as you walk into your next class? Yes. Right. And I think we had a great speech the other day about, you remember what is it, 80% of the things that you teach? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this POCO method is really fun because it really brings a lot of people together, um, professors, students, and then kind of peer leaders. And together, we're actually, it's pretty mutually beneficial. So anyway, feel good about what you do. When you walk into class, you're not just helping them through one question. It's really helping them build a foundation of the science so they can be successful later on. And then you also get some, uh, some benefits too, which is good. OK, I'm done talking. OK, POCO. Yeah, but of course, there's always more innovation to come, so we're just going to look forward to see what happens next. Um, so now, okay, now we're going to talk about the quicker questions. It's MO theory. Um, it can be a little confusing to people. So I would pay attention in lecture if I were you, um, just if there's some things that you weren't clear on, uh, the professors hopefully will clear it up. Um, it'll be fun. The, the main question of the day is why do frogs float? So we'll see if we can come up with an answer after we discuss. Feel too polar or non-polar. Yeah. Yeah. What did you say? Polar. Right, right. Because you'll have hydrogens on one side. Yeah. Well, it would be more of a tetrahedral structure because you've got the C in the middle and the two H's and then the two C's. figured it. I don't know if maybe they do actually stick electrons in the antibonding, but the way the antibonding things work is that it's an area where there are no electrons, right? Because if you look in the ebook, it's like a little node of no electrons, basically. And so it's, uh, it's not constructive inter interference, it's destructive interference. So they cross over each other, but it's destructive <laughs> interference rather than constructive interference. 
because the constructive interference is where you get bonding because they add together. But if you have the destructive interference, then they subtract and you don't get any of the neutrons. So that's why I don't think there will be electrons in the anti-bonding. So for sure they have higher energy and that's why the electrons don't want to go there. I wonder if they're trying to trick everyone. Or this if might they be realize one. They this might be one of those trickier questions. So we be see them. Yeah. That would be the one I would pick just simply because I don't think there's going to be things in the antibody. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on this one. This one's really iffy without listening to the lecture. I'm sure like somewhere in the lecture they'll mention oh, yeah. something about Today. this. And this is one of the ones where you don't yeah, it's a it's a weird concept. Um, it makes a lot of sense when you're drawing out the molecular orbitals um, because they're the ones that are star, right? So, um, I don't know. That's how I know. Questions is it the highest electron? Oh, yeah. So, where did, did y'all work this one out to see where the highest energy electrons are? I know it's your favorite. The bond order is not 35. Oh man. Alright. Uh, perfect. Um, is it diamagnetic or ferrous? That's a good question. Yeah, we'll just say it's most likely diamagnetic. I think it's the how do you fill in this? Like, how do you fill in the electrons? Somebody want to answer that? Like, how do you fill in the electrons? This thing we do normally, so like each side is one over nitrogen.
So how would you get a student to start thinking about this? Any ideas? So between the highest, so where that last electron is, so say we fill this up and I don't know exactly, like this exact one, I'm just throwing it out there, but you have like, this would be, right, that would be where your last electron was, and then there's that nothing's in this one, so this would be your highest mode, this would be your home mode, the next one would be your blue mode. So there's a gap between that and how much energy it takes to excite this electron into that next one. And because the IR is the low energy, step. right, they want to decrease this gap such that, you know, you can, you can make that jump easier. By increase, so that so again, this y-axis is based on energy. So you just look at the the wave, the infrared, right, is higher wavelength, longer wavelength. So the energy is going to be low. You can kind of think about it like the photoelectric effect. If you want to absorb a photon, you know, lower frequency, longer wavelength, lower energy, you're going to have to decrease energy in your bandwidth. You have to get a not as energetic. And vice versa, sometimes they'll ask, um, I've seen them ask, like, how much energy would be released if an electron in an excited state went down to the next. Here's something now. They should do a demo, an actual demo. They bring just a show frog. a video. They, they should just start, bring a like frog a video. and like, actually do the whole invitation in class. Oh, they have, they have, in the second sentence, they have the Wizard of Oz experience. You put like foil and like copper, like it starts dissolving and the screen gas comes out. Oh, we did that. We did that. Like Kim Lab, like yeah. the conversation. I, I call it the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. We did that last year. Green smoke comes yeah. out, I call it yeah. the witch. Yeah. We did that during uh, the photovoltaic section. So I think that's that the last quicker question. Oh wait, wait a sec, I got more. Yeah, we should have a whole nother. Did sheet. we get? Did we get? Did we no, do we the did bond order first. for H two? That one we did. No. No, we haven't done bond. Isn't it H two plus or something? H two plus. Good. So yeah, it's on this one. It wasn't on the other one because I was just. Oh, it is. This one just doesn't have. The other Okay, bond order isn't like that's like one half. So the equation for bond order is bonding. It's electrons in bonding order minus anti. Minus electrons in anti bonding order divided by the yeah, times half. So E in bonding. What did you say? So let's um right. So it's gonna be bonding order minus electrons in anti bonding order. Right. And then the anti-bonding is just destructive interference. Yeah. Bonding is conceptual. We can use that actually, you probably want to use for this question this picture because you can they actually draw on the thing for us so we can just yeah. 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 Just now telling them that there's an anti bonding particles that affect yeah. This is going to be. 
be interesting. This is one of the times where you're going to just not know the answer. And you're going to have to figure out how to reconcile that with the student. And just either tell them, hey, this is really weird thinking. I'm not a particularly like expert in quantum mechanics, and so this would be something to take to the TAs. Or you could have them discuss it amongst themselves or something like that. But yeah, this is this is one of the times where you're probably not going to know the answer. If they come up with like any sort of strange questions, and I'm sure with quantum they will come up with some sort of strange question. Then Hopefully if we just pay attention to the lecture today, it's kind of my goal. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be hard, like, hard, because, like, the goal of this chapter is just kind of, like, a cursory understanding, mm -hmm. and it's, there's so many more questions that like, are not so cursory, and so yeah. don't really get to <laughs> see that point right away, unfortunately. I think it's, like, it's between the two big metal rocks. This will just be. <laughs> I think it pulls the other more towards the like, It will be like this, which is over here. Yeah. 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 At least we we'll get like a whole bunch of lecture yeah. where they try and answer the questions. At least the professors are trying to get the students to figure it out on their own before lecturing. I don't think that would work with this. It's not like this sort of stuff. What makes you say that they go in the same direction? Same side? This is how I draw it because it needs to go like this. Well, I know you can drop that way a bit because chlorine and hydrogen can't cancel it out. Even if they're like across the way from each other, they're technically not across the way because they're not touching each other. Yeah. So even though you can draw them in a plane like form on the paper, like technically, technically, like if you wanted to see all the part, like technically they'd be like you know the little loops, and that's not like right across. Like technically, if these are CLs, that's not right across. Like, um. And even if there's two or three else, one's like more back, so they're not. There's not an orbital here. This is a But it works when there's four because it can like all level out. It's all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because the only way this can be non polar is if it's like CL2 and they can't see each other out, but you're thinking because they could be. Yeah, you would still be able to like twist it yeah. in some way that you would get the CLs on one side and the H's on the other side, and you would have some sort of separation there. <laughs> As long as at least one of them is different, you can get some sort of difference in the You need less energy the electron. I think just the words increase the efficiency of the electron. I mean, just don't try to overthink it. So you have to excite the molecule for it to create a do you have any other questions, comments, concerns? This is, this is one of those days where you'll just kind of feel like I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> okay, so let's work together because I think maybe. Okay, just a couple of notes. A couple of notes, guys. See you all. Okay. Um, you guys had a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate you all coming prepared. Um, it was awesome to see all your work. Um, I want to ask a couple questions about MO theory, in particular um, the homo gap. I don't know if you guys got to that. Dr. Vanderbilt, if you're in the night grade class, some of his research is based on that, so it would be really fun to listen to that. And my senior project for uh, physical chemistry was based on homo gap, so um, it's fun to talk about. But more importantly, we have to get them to the basics, which is like filling in the charts. As far as I know, they don't have to memorize the charts for MO theory because it gets very complicated, and that's why we use computers. Antibonding is very complicated, and that's why we just tell them what it is, and then if they need to know, they'll go into PCHEM. Um, so where do, you think, <laughs> where do you think they're going to have the most trouble today in lecture? Chart. 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 What was tricky about the one for nitrogen? What did they not include in that? The 1s. Yes. Yeah, the 1s orbitals. So if they don't pay attention and they fill in with seven electrons instead of five, 
their answer is going to be different. What is their answer going to be? You might be able to, you guys back here can see. If they did instead of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and they put 12, or 14, sorry, they would have it's the pi 2p star. Yeah. So if you see that answer, you might automatically know, and you guys back there can't see, but you can look at your chart. Um, you might automatically know that they included their one s electrons, which is great, but it's not part of this chart. Uh, and then the question is, why do frogs float? Because they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. No, but why do they actually float? In magnetic fields. Because they're being repelled by those magnetic fields, since most molecules are diamagnetic. What's a notable one that's not diamagnetic that we use every day? Oxygen. Um, so, last thing, and then I'll release you. There's on everybody's table, there's a chart. I rearrange your sections a little bit because um, and it's a little scary to go to a new section, a new part of the room, but this is beneficial to you and the students. Uh, students sometimes need a different person to explain them, or students in a different section might be waiting for the perfect John to come and talk to them, and they really just <laughs> jive with your explanations, and they, and they didn't have you in their section. They didn't know you existed until today when you go and talk to them. Um, and for you, it's good to get out of your comfort zone and talk to new students. Um, so read that, take a picture of it, get comfortable with your new section, get to know the students. Um, yeah, and, and today's going to be a little hard, so really prompt the students to think, to discuss, um, and also not to panic. So on that note, thanks guys. See you in class. More yes? Oxygen. Oxygen. Oh, yeah. I have one to the ceiling. Particular. I actually have too much anxiety, so it comes fine. No, I like it a lot. You can more just memorize that. But it's You could do one. But um, it is the language that we use to talk about bonding all the time. And so our question for the day is an odd one. Um, it's why in the world does a frog float in a magnetic field? Um, which would also be true for you. If I could get a big enough magnet, I could actually levitate each and every one of you. Um, and so the question is why? Why in the world does that happen? Um, and we will think about that from molecular normal theory. So, um, to, we have two learning modules due before next class. So 22 and 23, okay? Oh, that reminds me, our learning modules and homework today I moved the deadline back to three because things slowed down, slowed down, slowed down, slowed down. So if you did not have a chance to do it or you frantically were trying to complete it, um, the deadlines moved back to three o'clock today. These, hopefully everything will be smooth and by nine tomorrow all will be well. Also again, two non-graded learning modules, the Lottie Lectures 12 and 13, if you are interested. So, um, we're going to start off today with a few, with a quick clicker quiz, thinking up uh, our shapes and polarity and valence bonds. So, on your own, from your own mind, you will quiz yourself here and answer: Do you think this following molecule is polar or nonpolar? And we're on CD as always. And just to help you along, I will give you the Lewis side to make sure you know what it looks like. Polar, non-polar. Shouldn't take very long. Normally, you'd have to be drawing the structure. Here's the structure. I drew it for you. One, here we go. So let's see what we got. OK, we're undecided, although most of us like that it's non-polar. Uh, some 29% of us think that it's polar. Can somebody tell me why they think it's non-polar? Yeah. If you, if you're, here, if you're saying because of the symmetry, those two are canceling. Does anybody else have an answer for why the term was polar? Yes. Because it's symmetrical. So symmetrical things are polar? More or less, okay? Do we have another choice for, for why you think it's polar? Or anybody else have the two chlorines are not going to cancel each other out? So let's think about that one again quickly, not as a quiz, but as a poll here. You guys can rapidly discuss it amongst yourselves and see if you can come to a consensus on polar or non-polar. Let's try to get 90% of you into a particular answer. <laughs> well, 
also, could you just draw the chlorine at the bottom? I mean, you can draw symmetrically, but even then, it's a technical thing. So if it's in 3D space, will they cancel out? Really, because we're not directly across from each other. Is there a way you can draw that? I don't know if they can draw out. <laughs> Maybe they both. to that side of the room. The two hydrogens are over here. They're ending up positive over here. So I get negative on this. I'll switch some. I'll make these opposite now by changing them. And I'll put the hydrogen here, and I'll put the chlorine here. And of course, what do I end up with? I end up with the exact same molecule because it's a tetrahedral shape. And so you can move them around all you want, but you end up with the same thing. Each one is next to all three other positions. It's 109 degrees apart for every single one. So you, you can't be opposite. You can only be next to another one. And so any time they're not all the same, it's going to be polar. So this idea over here was if one of them is different, it's going to be polar. Take this one, make it a lone pair. It's going to be polar. Take these two, make it a lone pair. It's going to be polar. The only way to make the tetral geometry Non-polar, all chlorines, all hydrogen. Okay, quickly, so that we make it through our material for today. Another quick question. This one, we're back to our quiz. We sat and quiet. sigma bonds and pi bonds are there respectively. So count up the sigma bonds, count up the pi bonds, see what you get. I'm going to draw another structure. things are there, and it's a much harder thing 
to be able to count them all up. But nonetheless, you will get practice so that you will be able to look at a molecule and say, how many double bonds are there in that molecule? There's one, two, three, four. How many bi bonds are there? There's four. How many lone pairs are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, something like that. Okay? No, one, two, three, four, five. I'm counting them all. All right, so um, you need to know how to do line drawings. Okay? If you need more practice, there's a worksheet. You need more practice. So quickly, summary, in case somehow you've missed it. All right, electronic geometries. In our Vesper language, we say the electrons, certain number of regions of high electron density, that's our electronic geometry. That's here, okay? That's our little one here, electronic geometry. And then we have our regions of high electron density. Let's just move the screen here somewhere. There we go. Two regions, three regions, four regions, five regions, six regions. How are we going to think about the bonding of those molecules? We're going to, to achieve the geometry we want. We are going to hybridize the central atom to have the right geometry. So if there are two regions of high electron density, it's going to be sp. If there are three, it's going to be sp for the common orbitals. <coughs> sp3, one, two, three, four. Three p's and an s. sp, one s, one p, that's two. And so the number of orbitals corresponds to the number of regions of high electron density. And so it is just a different language for talking about the same thing. So if I have this molecule, sp3, yeah, sp3, because everything that has tetrahedral electronic geometry is sp3. Water is sp3, ammonia is sp3, all the methanes are sp3. So, what are we going to do today? Today, we're going to talk about a different theory for bonding. It has to do with molecular orbital theory. And the key is, I'll just put it down here for you. Valence bond, it's the bonds. Okay, so in valence bond theory, I want to point at a bond and I want to because it's talking about the electron between those two atoms. How am I making the bonds between those two atoms? Molecular orbital theory doesn't think about bonds at all. It thinks about the whole molecule. And the problem comes, as you'll see in just a moment, is we're going to talk about molecular orbital theory for diatomic molecules. So if you have just two atoms, the whole together, in molecular orbital theories, I'm going to mix up the atomic orbitals on all the atoms in the molecule. That is, I'm looking not for atomic orbitals, but I want to think about where are the electrons in a whole molecule. And so now I think about the molecule as an entity into itself. And it's not to be thought of as discrete atoms with discrete bonds in between them. OK, so let's just think about this for a second for ethanol. Right? One, two, three, four regions around the carbon. It's going to be an sp3 carbon. One, two, three, four regions around the oxygen. It's going to be an sp3 oxygen. Head-on bond here. All single bonds are sigma bonds. So it's going to be a sigma sp3 sp3. And I can point to any of the bonds in that molecule and talk about them. But really, in molecular orbital theory, we're going to think about the, the, the thing as a whole. Same thing with oxygen. Here's diatomic oxygen. It's got a double bond here. Ooh, it's got some kind of crazy, drawing too many dots on it. Um, here, right, I could point to this one and say there's a sigma bond and there's a pi bond. So in paramagnetic, we have unpaired electrons. And diamagnetic, they're all paired. And does anybody remember what effect that has in the world? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's more subtle if we have metals and things, but generally speaking, is one of them attracted to the metal? Okay? So now my question becomes what do you think about O2? Is O2 paramagnetic or diamagnetic? That was O2 have unpaired electrons or all the electrons paired? With conviction, we all think <laughs> paired. Most of us think paired. Same thing that are unpaired electrons. And if there are, can we point to them in my diagram? I've got a lone pair. The name gives it away. 
low magnet. And so first when liquid nitrogen is poured onto a magnet, the magnetic field does not affect the liquid. Forgot the when you pour liquid oxygen onto a magnet, however, it is held by the magnet because oxygen molecules are paramagnetic. Paramagnetic substances have unpaired electrons. Ooh, ah, we all ooh and ah. <laughs> okay, so here it is. There it is. It's it's out. Out. Have unpaired. I was stuck in my nice paired electrons everywhere, and as a result, O2, not all paired electrons. So how in the world are we going to do that? We have to come up with a new theory. Okay, so the only way we're ever going to understand that being paramagnetic is we're going to need some kind of new theory. Sorry, I'm drawing here, so he's going to get it straightened out. There we go. New theory. Okay, and so um, to do that, I want to go back, and we're going to think about molecules. Again, we're all going to promise that even though it looks like we're thinking about a bond between two atoms, we're thinking about the whole molecule here, because that's our idea. And we're going to 